Uh, for today's presentation, I wanted to do something a little bit different. So normally I try to keep landscapes and man-made attractions separate in my presentations just to make them a little bit more streamlined, but I didn't think that would be a particularly fruitful approach when it comes to Tibet specifically. After all, many of the holiest sites in Tibet are natural and are often home to temple complexes or monasteries of huge significance. In order to really narrow down my focus a bit, I'm only going to be talking about sacred spaces that are located within the Tibetan Autonomous Region or Tibet in China. So bear in mind that large parts of Sichuan province and Qinghai province, which are also located in the west of China, did once belong to the regions of Kham and Amdo, respectively, which form two of the three core parts of the Kingdom of Tibet. So they're very heavily influenced by Tibetan culture and architecture. Uh, so therefore, this presentation is by no means an exhaustive list of the holy places you could potentially visit if you want to do a deep dive into Tibetan spirit spirituality during your trip. To Tibet. Uh, I would also recommend if you are interested in other parts of sort of the Tibetan Empire, the old Tibetan Empire, uh, the, the presentation on the Tibetan ethnic minority, I touch more on what that means, like the Kham and Amdo regions uh, and the difference in culture between Kham and Amdo versus what is Tibet, which was once known as Utsang. Um, and it was the, the core, historical core of Tibet. Uh, so for now, in terms of structure, I'm going to be following roughly the same route that we use for our full circuit tour of Tibet. So we'll be moving from the well-known sacred sites of Lhasa through to hidden gems in places like Gertzla and Wenbu. As you may have guessed, there are more monasteries and temple complexes in Tibet than there are stars in the sky. So the ones I've chosen today are based on either how famous they are or how unusual they are. As I mentioned earlier, however, it's important to note that man-made monasteries and temples do not represent the holiest places in Tibet. Many of these complexes are based near mountains and lakes for one very good reason. It's actually the mountains and lakes themselves that are the sacred spaces, and the temples are simply there just to honour them. For this reason, I'll be spending a fair bit of time today talking about these mountains and lakes in order to illuminate why they continue to hold such a high status within both Tibetan Buddhism and also, perhaps more importantly, an indigenous Tibetan religion known as Bon, which again, if you're interested in, I'll talk about in a bit more depth in the ethnic minority presentation. Uh, now, without further ado, let's head to Lhasa and take a look at one of the most iconic structures in the city, and I'm sure everyone knows what I'm going to click through to. Uh, so, of course, there would be no way I could talk about the sacred spaces of Tibet without first mentioning the Patala Palace. Rising atop the Marpori or Red Mountain at an altitude of 3,750 metres or about 12,300 feet, it ranks as the highest ancient palace in the world. Since it literally towers over Lhasa, it simply can't be missed as you're wandering through the city itself. The palace's spiritual importance is embodied even in its name which is derived from Mount Potalaka, the legendary abode of the Buddhist Bodhisattva Avilokitesvara. Uh, for anyone who might not be familiar with that term, I'll briefly explain it now because it's going to come up a lot during this presentation, including a lot of like Buddhist terms. So the term Bodhisattva literally means one whose goal is awakening. It refers to a person who seeks enlightenment and is thus on the path to becoming a Buddha. It can actually be applied to anyone, surprisingly, from a newly inducted Buddhist to a veteran or celestial bodhisattva who has achieved supernatural powers through their training. Although more often than not, when we use the term bodhisattva, we're referring to those really cool, magical ones as opposed to just regular people. Uh, in this instance, Avilokitesvara is one of the most well-known and powerful bodhisattvas within the religion. Although you may know her by her Chinese name of Guanyin. I say her, Avilokitesvara is a man. Um, or a male deity, but then for some reason when he came to China, uh, he had a sex change and he is now a woman, she, and Guanyin is female, a female deity, uh, but that's a story for another day. Uh, not only is the palace named after a sacred place, but it is also located on one. It rests on one of three main hills known as the Three Protectors of Tibet. You've got Chokpuri Mountain, which represents the Bodhisattva Vajrapani, Pogwarni Mountain, which signifies Manjushri, another Bodhisattva, and then Marpori Mountain, which, as I said earlier, symbolizes Avilokitesvara. In other words, you could say that the palace is located on a prime piece of spiritual real estate. The history of the palace dates all the way back to 637 AD, when it was initially masterminded by Songsen Gampo, the first ruler of the Tibetan Empire. Sadly, this is not the same palace you see today, as the original palace was destroyed during the civil wars that followed the collapse of the Tibetan Empire. 
This palace remained in ruins until the 17th century, when Nuang Lobsang Gyatso, the fifth Dalai Lama, unified Tibet and became its political as well as its spiritual leader. When he decided to move his capital to Lhasa, a spiritual advisor named Konchong Chopel pointed out that restoring the ruins of the Patala Palace would provide them with an ideal seat of government, since his elevated position offered it protection, and it was also very close to two integral Buddhist monasteries, the Drepung Monastery and the Sera Monastery. In 1645, construction began on the new palace, and within three years, the White Palace had been completed. From 1670 to 1690, uh, oh, 1690 sorry, to 1694, it was expanded to include the magnificent Red Palace. Overall, over 7,000 labourers and 1,500 artisans were required to complete this mammoth task. The end result was a glorious 13-storey high palace, encompassing over 1,000 rooms and decorated with countless murals, painted scrolls, sculptures, statues, porcelain wares, intricately woven carpets, silk curtains, and fine objects of gold and silver. The palace is not only known for its aesthetic beauty, however. Its libraries contain a boundless collection of valuable sutras and historical documents, which means it continues to play a key role in Tibetan Buddhist practice even to this day. Uh, in terms of its layouts, there are a few sections of the Patala Palace where the original structure has actually been restored and preserved. In particular, there are two chapels in the northwest corner of the palace that contain remnants of Song Seng Gampo's original palace. These are known as the Saint's Chapel and the Dharma Cave, which are conveniently also regarded as two of the holiest sites in the palace, so well worth a visit. The Saint's Chapel contains a jewel-encrusted statue of the Bodhisattva Avilokiteswana, alongside a rather ominous passageway that ends up leading into the Dharma Cave. This was the place where Song Seng Gampo himself supposedly meditated and pursued his study of Buddhism. The walls of the caves are bedecked with images of Song Seng Gampo, along with his wives, Princess Bikruti of the Nepalese Lichavi Kingdom, which existed from 400 to 750 AD, and then Princess Wencheng of the Han Chinese Tang Dynasty, which was the second golden age in Chinese history. Uh, so it's these two princesses that are largely credited with having introduced him to Buddhism and, and encouraged his pursuit of Buddhist studies. Now, let's take a moment to soak in the beauty of the palace for ourselves, with a short video that we've taken of the Patala Palace. I'm just gonna pop, uh, pause the recording as well. So now I have to stop share and then reshare. Sorry about this. This is gonna happen a lot. I don't know why it's changed this, but this is the Patala Palace in all its glory. Before it moves on to an ad. But yes, that's it. Now let's pull up the presentation again. Hmm. Seamless. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, the Batala Palace is essentially split into two main areas. You've got the White Palace and the Red Palace. No prizes for guessing what they're named after. Uh, the older White Palace is made up of two wings on either side of the newer Red Palace. So you can see here the White Palace and then the Red Palace, nicely color-coded, uh, with the white, white Palace representing the political center of the structure and the Red Palace being its sort of spiritual core. It originally served as the main seat of the Tibetan government and the residence of the Dalai Lama, but from the 18th century onwards, it was only used as a winter palace. During the summer, the Dalai Lama and his entourage would move to the newly built Norbulinka. Uh, meaning jeweled park in Tibetan, the Norbulinka is both a palace complex and a gorgeous imperial garden. The lush gardens themselves cover an area of around 46 acres, which makes it the largest man-made garden in Tibet, while the palace is comprised of over 370 rooms. It was originally built in 1755 and masterminded by the seventh Dalai Lama, but successive Dalai Lamas would expand the complex over a period of 200 years following its initial construction. Lamas would expand the comp. Oh, sorry. It, in total, it consists of four different palaces, known as Kelsang Potrang, Sokil Potrang, the Golden Linka, and Takten Migyo Potrang. 
Each palace is then divided up into three sections. So you've got the palace buildings, the palace courtyard, and then the palace gardens. Two sets of walls would separate each palace. So the area encompassed by the inner wall would be exclusively for the use of the Dalai Lama and his attendants, while the space between the inner and outer walls, I find this quite funny, was reserved for officials and the Dalai Lama's royal family. So if he ever wanted to just get away from his family, all he had to do was just go from the inner, the sort of the bit between the inner and outer walls into the inner walls, and then they weren't allowed in. Uh, from the 1780s right up until 1959, the noble Linka served as the lavish summer residence of the Dalai Lama, where he would take care of political matters as well as conduct religious ceremonies. The Kelsang Potrang was the first of the four palaces to have been built and was actually named after its mastermind, the seventh Dalai Lama. It's a three story structure complete with prayer halls, bedrooms, reading rooms, and meditation chambers. What makes this palace particularly special is that its walls are almost entirely covered in murals. They're surprisingly quite secular in nature, since they largely depict what daily life was like for the Tibetan people. Now nestled at the centre of a lake, the Sokula Potrang is more like an elaborate pavilion than a palace, with stone bridges connecting it to gardens on both sides. With its golden roof, engraved copper tiles, Buddhist murals and plethora of Buddhist statues, it is one of the most artistically impressive palaces in the complex. The third palace, known as the Golden Linka, is the only one within the complex that was not built at the request of the Dalai Lamas, and was instead funded by a rich benefactor in 1922 as a gift to the 13th Dalai Lama. Then finally, the Takten Migyo Potrang is arguably the most magnificent of them all, and is also the youngest, having been built by the 14th Dalai Lama in 1954, so relatively recent history. With its Italian chandeliers, and I, I don't know how to pronounce this word in Spanish, a janta frescoes, I hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, this palace is far more modern in its style, but still retains features of traditional Tibetan architecture and decor. The murals in the South Hall are of particular note, since again, rather than portraying religious scenes, they vividly depict the establishment and history of Tibet. Now, the Norbulinka continues to be a hive of religious activity to this day, with numerous monks calling the palace home. It pales in comparison, however, to a certain temple in Lhasa that has risen to become a spiritual icon in the city. Now, I'm sure many of you here will have heard of and perhaps even visited the Jokhang Temple, which is widely considered to be the holiest house of worship in Tibet. To this end, although it is technically dedicated to the Gelug or Yellow Hat sect of Tibetan Buddhism, which is the most popular sect, it currently accepts worshippers from all branches of Buddhism, not just Tibetan Buddhism. The architecture of the complex embraces this sense of diversity, as it incorporates features from traditional Tibetan, Indian and Nepalese architecture to create a seamless blend of these three styles. The temple was originally built in 652 AD by Songtsen Gampo, the aforementioned founder of the Tibetan Empire. However, the nature of its construction is shrouded in mystery. Countless legends surround the sacred site. The most prevalent of which is that in ancient times, the Tibetan people believed that Tibet rested on the back of a wild demoness known as Shrin Ma. Whenever the king tried to build the temple, it would miraculously collapse overnight and they'd have to begin construction all over again. It was apparently the king's second wife, Princess Wen Chung of the Han Chinese Tang Dynasty, who discovered that it was in fact the demoness thwarting their attempts to propagate Buddhism throughout the region. In order to halt her evil schemes, the king was required to build 12 temples, four on the frontiers, four in the outer areas, and then four in central Tibet. Finally, the last temple had to be built over the site of a lake, which was said to be the demoness's heart. Using 1,000 goats to carry soil from nearby mountains, I kind of love that sort of weird detail, uh, the lake was filled and the Jokhang temple was built in its place, therefore subjugating the demoness once and for all. Now, another legend recounts how the king reputedly tossed his ring and then promised to build a temple wherever it landed. And that's how the Jokhang Temple came to be. It landed in a lake, kind of like the mighty Excalibur, and a white stupa emerged from beneath the crystal clear waters over which the temple was eventually built. So another sort of magical retelling of how this temple came to be. Uh, a far more likely explanation is that the temple was built to house the statue of Ashobha, the Ash. God, my pronunciation is really bad to say, Akshobya Buddha, which the king's first wife, Princess Bikruti of the Nepalese Lichavi Kingdom, brought with her as her dowry. Not to be outdone, however, Princess Wen Chung presented the king with a far more valuable gift, one that is still revered as the holiest idol in Tibet to this day. It was a statue of the Shakyamuni Buddha, but not just any statue. 
This statue, known as the Jowo Shakyamuni or the Jowo Rinpoche, was supposedly carved at the behest of Gautama Buddha himself, the original first Buddha, and is one of only three such statues that the historical Buddha permitted to have made of his likeness during his lifetime. The statue was originally housed in the Ramoche Temple, but was moved to the Jokhang Temple on the death of Song Sen Gampo for security reasons. In fact, the Jokhang Temple was originally known as the Suklakang, or the House of Religious Science, but was renamed the Jokhang Temple, which means the Temple of the, temple of the Jowo or Jowo Rinpoche, in honor of this statue. From 756 to 797, during the reign of Chaisong Detsan, the king's minister became particularly hostile towards the spread of Buddhism in Tibet, so the statue actually had to be hidden. When the fifth Dalai Lama, Nuang Lobsang Gyatso, unified Tibet and became its independent leader during the 17th century, the temple and Lhasa as a whole enjoyed a golden era of spirituality. Although the temple was expanded greatly during this time, much of the original 7th century structure has been remarkably well preserved. The temple itself is a four-story timber structure with a distinctive golden top. From the main square, one can view the entire complex. There are two steels in the square as well, one recording an alliance between the King of Tibet and the Emperor of the Tang Dynasty, and the other bizarrely kind of engraved with hygiene tips on how to prevent the spread of smallpox, so both equally important, I feel. At over 1,300 years of age, the Buddha Hall is the oldest building in the complex. It is where the sacred Jowo Shakyamuni statue is currently housed, and also contains magnificent gilded statues of Song Sen Gampo, Princess Bikruti, and Princess Wen Chung. A number of chapels surround the main hall, all dedicated to various deities and bodhisattvas in the Buddhist canon. From there, the halls and chapels of the complex are connected by a labyrinth of these beautiful secluded corridors that are illuminated only by flickering candles. It's really quite magical. Uh, outside, the doors and roofs are bedecked with these beautiful golden engravings, from deer flanking the Dharma wheel to monstrous dragons that are kind of guarding the eaves of the, the temple. When it comes to worship, there are three pilgrimage circuits in Lhasa. The Linkor, which encircles the city's sacred district, the Barkor, which circumvents the Jokhang Temple specifically, and then the Nangkor, a religious corridor within the Jokhang Temple that surrounds the statue of the Jowo Shakyamuni. Every day, hundreds of pilgrims perform what's known as a kora around each of these three circuits while prostrating themselves, chanting sacred mantras or spinning prayer wheels. Uh, so just to give anyone who doesn't know, a kora is it's literally just a circuit, a sacred circuit that people walk as part of a pilgrimage. Um, they can be massive and take days or they can be as small as, as I said, going around that just that one statue. For this reason, the temple is closed to tourists in the morning and is reserved solely for pilgrims who are there to perform koras. While the historical and spiritual significance of Tibet's capital is not to be underestimated, it's important to note that monasteries and temples make up only a fraction of the sacred spaces in Tibet. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, most of these houses of worship are actually built in honour of natural landscapes, which tend to be the actual targets of worship. With that in mind, let's head out of the city and venture into the countryside of Tibet in order to marvel at some of its holiest lakes and mountains. So alongside Namso Lake and Lake Manasarova, Yamdrok Lake ramps, ranks as one of the three holiest lakes in Tibet, and I'm sure some of you will have heard of at least one of those three names. It rests at the southern foot of the Himalayan mountain range and was thus formed by melted snow that trickled down from the peaks that surround it. Its official surface area is listed as 638 square kilometres, or about 246 square miles, but it's incredibly difficult to measure due to the lake's really unusual shape. When viewed from above, the lake has two distinct kind of long arms that go out that make it look a bit like a scorpion. As with many alpine lakes throughout western China, Yamdok Lake has numerous small islands dotted throughout its expanse, which serve as resting places for a wide variety of different bird species. So if you're a bird watcher during autumn and winter, thousands of birds migrate to the lake in order to nest. So it's actually one of the lesser known bird watching hotspots of the region. The lake's greatest claim to fame, however, of course, lies in its religious significance. The local Tibetan people believed that the lake was once a goddess that transformed herself, which is how it initially became a popular site for pilgrimage. Every year, monks and lay people travel to the lake in order to walk the Kora around its circumference, which can take an average of around seven days to complete. It is believed that if you perform the Kora successfully, it will wash away your sins and mean that you're more likely to experience good fortune in the future. In terms of Tibetan Buddhism, however, the lake holds a far more important function. 
So Yandrock Lake has been used for decades to help Tibetan people find the Dalai Lama. This process is based on what is known as the Tolku system, which is unique to Tibetan Buddhism. And I'll talk a little bit about it here and what it is, because it's quite complicated. Uh, so the Tolku system actually began towards the end of the 12th century, although the rank of Dalai Lama didn't even exist back then. So the Dalai Lama is the most famous one that is known internationally, but there were a lot of Tolkus before the Dalai Lama even existed. Now, the basic concept behind the Tolku system is that there are certain powerful spirits that can actually control and direct their own rebirth. So they are theoretically born with the same skills and knowledge from their previous lives, and they sort of accrue knowledge over time that way. A Tolku is any person who harbors one of these spirits and is therefore kind of regarded as a spiritual custodian of sorts. Now, the most famous example is, of course, the Dalai Lama, who is the head of the Gelug sect of, the, of Tibetan Buddhism. But there's also the Panchen Lama, who exists directly below him. In fact, it is estimated that there are around 500 Tolku lineages that are acknowledged throughout Tibet, Bhutan, India, Nepal and Mongolia at the moment. After a Dalai Lama passes away, the senior monks are left with the arduous task of finding the boy who harbours the reincarnated soul of the Dalai Lama and is therefore the next Dalai Lama. To this end, they gather on the banks of the lake to chant and pray before throwing a narrow strip of ceremonial cloth known as a hada, along with other sacred items, into the lake itself. By peering into the water, they are supposedly offered a reflection of the specific location where the Dalai Lama's soul currently resides. In short, you can think of Yamdok Lake as sort of a holy GPS. Alongside the Dalai Lama, the lake is connected to another very prominent tolku as well. On a peninsula that juts into the lake, you'll find the Samding Monastery, which is the only Tibetan monastery that is actually headed by a woman instead of a man. Uh, and this is very sort of uh, what makes it particularly unique is that it's not a nunnery. So nunneries in Tibet are always headed by female abbots. But the female abbot that presides over this community also presides over a community of male monks, not just female nuns. So it's, comp it's totally unique in Tibet. And there's nothing else like it. Now, this female abbot is known as the Samding Dorhe Fagmo, who is considered to be the tolku of the goddess Vajravarahi. Not only is she considered to be the highest female incarnation in Tibetan Buddhism, she's also the third highest ranking person in the religion's hierarchy after the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lamas. So hugely important person. Now, with the most famous sacred lake out of the way, let's take a quick look at the most well-known sacred mountain. And again, no prizes for guessing what famous mountain we're going to be talking about today. It's, of course, Mount Everest. You had to know Mount Everest was going to come at some point. It's important to note, however, that in Tibet, it is more often referred to by its Tibetan name of Mount Kamulangma, which means goddess mother of the world. Its Sanskrit name of Sangamatha has similarly religious connections, as it means the peak of heaven. Standing at a colossal height of 8,850 metres or 29,035 feet, Mount Everest is, of course, the tallest mountain in the world and the highest point on planet Earth. I don't know why, but that always really impresses me. The fact that it's not just the tallest mountain, it is the highest point on this planet. I think that's really cool. It belongs to the Himalayas and is located on the border between Tibet and Nepal, but is regarded as a sacred mountain both by Tibetan and Nepalese people. With its three-sided pyramidal shape, the summit is described as having these three faces. You've got the north and the east face, which rise above Tibet, and then the southwest face, which is located in Nepal. Generally speaking, temperatures on Mount Everest are sub-zero year-round. You've probably guessed that without me telling you. With highs reaching only about nine, minus 19 degrees Celsius or minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit, and lows plummeting to around minus 36 to minus 60 degrees Celsius or minus 33 to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very cold. Uh, since the peak is so high that it reaches the lower limit of the jet stream, it can be buffeted by sustained winds rushing over 160 kilometers or 100 miles per hour. So I'm really tempting people right now to go climb, I'm sure. At the summit and on the upper slopes, lack of oxygen, powerful winds and extremely cold temperatures preclude the development of any plant or animal life. Hostile though it may be, the valleys below the mountains are actually inhabited by Tibetan speaking peoples, most well known of which are, of course, the Sherpas. In fact, the term Sherpa literally translates to mean people from the east and is in reference to their history as the Sherpa people are believed to be the successors of those Tibetan people that left eastern Tibet over 400 years ago and decided to settle in the uninhabited Himalayan valleys. These Sherpas tend to live in villages at an altitude of up to 4,270 metres, or about 14,000 feet, meaning they are uniquely acclimatised to the high altitude. 
The mountain is arguably most famous internationally for the numerous climbing attempts that are made on it every year. It goes without saying that Mount Everest is the most challenging mountain in the world to climb. And sadly, to date, around about 200 people have lost their lives while attempting to reach the summit. In fact, once climbers ascend past what's the 7,600 metre or 25,000 foot mark, they enter what's known colloquially as the death zone. So in this area, punishingly low temperatures can lead to frostbite on any part of the body that is exposed. And the oxygen levels are so low, and I find this again staggering, the oxygen levels are so low that the human body essentially starts to die. That's why it's called the death zone. So you can't spend a lot of time up there because your body is actually dying. The debilitating effects that it has on the body means that it takes most climbers an average of 12 hours to walk the distance of under two kilometers or one mile from South Cole to the summit. From a spiritual perspective, Mount Everest's northern base is home to the Rongbuk Monastery, which sits at an altitude of 5,000 metres, around about 6, 16,400 feet, sorry, and is thus the highest temple complex in the world. Tibetan Buddhists believe that the mountain is home, the home of a goddess named Miolang Sangma, who lives at the summit and is known as the goddess of inexhaustible giving, although apparently most of the things she gives are frostbite and a horrible, horrible perishing end. Uh, she ranks as one of what are known as the five long life sisters, who are a series of goddesses that are tasked with protecting a number of peaks along the Himalayan mountain range. In common depictions of her, she is shown riding a red or golden tigress, very majestic, and giving out jewels to those she believes are deserving of them. In some rather bizarre depictions, however, she's actually holding a mongoose in one hand, and it's the mongoose that kind of spits out the jewels. Uh, for anyone who's curious about what that might look like, here is one such depiction here. So you've got her riding on the beautiful tigress, everything looks very nice, and then there's a mongoose and he's spitting out jewels. Uh, it's kind of odd, but wonderful at the same time. It is believed by the local people that she regards all climbers on the mountain as uninvited and only partially welcomed guests guests, sorry. So appeasing her is of paramount importance. According to these legends, the presence of Miolang Sangma on the mountain means that the karmic effects of your actions while walking on Mount Everest are magnified. So you should be particularly careful and act with reverence whenever you are on her turf. Nowadays, both climbers and Sherpas must be blessed by a Sherpa Buddhist monk before attempting to climb the mountain. And Sherpas will perform rituals and make offerings at a makeshift shrine that has been established at base camp. Only then will they feel comfortable setting foot in the goddess's abode, as they believe she will protect them and grant them safe passage. Now, as we move along our circuit of Tibet, we come to the town of Gyatse, which is located, like Mount Everest, in the prefecture of Shigatse. While the Paltro Monastery may not rank among the most famous temple complexes in Tibet, it is by no means unimportant. It is one of the few monasteries in the region that incorporates teachings from multiple sects of Tibetan Buddhism. Within its walls, you'll find artwork and scriptures dedicated to the Sakya, Gelug, and Kayug sects of Tibetan Buddhism. The main temple of the monastery is known as the Sukla Kang and was built sometime between 1418 and 1425. This three story building follows the typical Tibetan style of architecture, with the ground floor being divided into the front hall, the main hall, and then the back hall. The main hall is where the monks study and chant, and is supported by a sequence of 48 colossal pillars. Like the front hall, there are also two small chapels on either side of this kind of main hall. Then the back hall, by contrast, is much, much smaller and is only supported by eight pillars. So it's really that sort of middle hall, the main hall, is the biggest one. The front hall is more of an entrance and the back hall is uh, just a, a smaller area for statues. There are another five chapels on the first floor and one large chapel on the top floor, which is home to a series of really beautiful murals. The murals in the main temple were painted following a deliberate and carefully planned design, which was based around the function of the hall and would typically and who would typically be worshipping inside of it. For example, in the main hall, you will find the three main Buddhas associated with Buddhism. You have Gautama Buddha, who's the uh, historic Buddha, Dipankara Buddha, um, and then Maitreya Buddha. So in very simplistic terms, and this is sort of really kind of washing, like glossing over a lot of really important Buddhist uh, scripture, Gautama Buddha is the historical Buddha, so the one that people are most familiar with. Um, even though he's depicted as being kind of fat and jolly, he was actually really skinny because he mostly starved himself. Uh, Dipankara Buddha is another one of the Buddhas of the past. So Buddhas sort of passed on, Buddhahood was achieved throughout history. And then Maitreya Buddha is regarded as the Buddha of the future. So think of it as sort of like, the second coming, but for Buddhism. 
Uh, the theory behind this is that there have been numerous Buddhas throughout history, and Gautama Buddha is simply the most recent one. So Dipankara Buddha is the one that would have come before him, and Maitreya Buddha is the one that will appear next on Earth. Now, the main object of worship within the main hall is this spectacular eight meter or 26 foot tall bronze statue of the Buddha, although there is another smaller bronze statue of the Buddha that is located in the back hall. This is not, however, the monastery's main claim to fame. In 1427, uh, the Tibetan noble Rabtan Kunzang Fak donated vast sums of money in order to expand the monastery, which led to the addition of what's known as a kumbum and a few other buildings. Uh, now, again, for anyone who might not be familiar with this term, a kumbum is a multi-storied stupa or a sort of mound-like tower that can commonly be found within Tibetan Buddhist temples and monasteries, and it's a sign of honour to have one. This colossal construction project was led by a monk named Kedru Ked sorry, Kedrupye, who was posthumously recognized as the first Panchen Lama. The Kumbum at the Palcho Monastery rose to become not only the most prominent of its kind in Gyatse, but also the most famous Kumbum in Tibet. This particular Kumbum is made up of a staggering 10 stories. From the first floor to the ninth floor, you will find 76 chapels with 108 doors. So it's massive. Each chapel contains a variety of stunning Buddhist statues as well. Thanks to this kind of expansive statue collection, this kumbum is sometimes referred to colloquially as the 100,000 Buddha stupa. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to be skimming over the next couple of places on our journey. This is not to say that they do not hold exceptional spiritual significance to the Tibetan people, because of course they do, but we've already looked at other mountains and lakes today, so I want to focus towards the end of the presentation on some kind of more unusual sites. As I mentioned earlier, Lake Manasarova ranks as one of the three holiest lakes in Tibet, like Yamdrok Lake. It is a freshwater lake that was formed thanks to, again, melting water coming from the Kailash glaciers, which originate from Mount Kailash, which will be our next port of call, our next sort of spiritual place. Unlike many sacred places in Tibet, which typically have Tibetan names of significance, Manasarova is actually derived from Sanskrit. It is formed from a combination of two Sanskrit words. The first, manas, can mean mind, but in its widest sense, as applied to all of the mental powers, it can mean intellect, intelligence, understanding, perception, sense, or consciousness. Now, the second word, sar sarovara, is far simpler and just translates to mean either a lake or a large pond. So it's the pond of the mind, or the, <laughs> the pond of the mind sounds terrible, the lake of the mind. The lake is considered to be sacred by practitioners from not only Tibetan Buddhism, but also those from Bon, that Tibetan indigenous religion I mentioned, Hinduism and Jainism. Within Hinduism, it is reputedly the first lake that was created in the mind of Lord Brahma, after which time it then manifested on Earth. This is where its Sanskrit name comes from, as it is a lake that literally came from the mind. Hindu worshippers believe that the lake is a personification of purity, so drinking or bathing in its waters will cleanse you of all sin. Buddhists associate the lake with a legendary lake within Buddhist scripture known as Anavatapta. The name Anavatapta means lake without heat, and is in reference to the belief that the lake waters could soothe the fires that tormented any being, so really nice as well. Within Jainism, the lake's spiritual pedigree is certainly no less grand, as it is associated with the first saviour and teacher of the Dharma, a deity known as Rishabha. As you may have already guessed, the shores of the lake are thus home to numerous monasteries and temples, which accommodate worshippers from all of the four religions when they make pilgrimages to the lake. Now, much like the nearby lake of Manasarova, Mount Kailash is considered to be a sacred place by the four religions of Buddhism, Bon, Hinduism and Jainism. Its name is similarly derived from Sanskrit, although there is some debate about what the word is actually based on. So most people agree that the word is based on the Sanskrit word Kailasa, which is the name of the heavenly abode belonging to the two Hindu deities, Shiva and Kubera. Some linguists have theorized, however, that it might actually be based on the word Kailasa, which means crystal. The mountain itself stands at a lofty height of 6,638 meters, or 21,700 feet, making it the tallest peak in the Kailash mountain range, although not perhaps as impressive as Mount Everest. As you may have guessed from its name, its spiritual significance within Hinduism lies in the belief that the mountain serves as the home of Shiva, which is one of the three principal deities of Hinduism. In one rather magical account, which can be found in a Hindu religious text known as the Vishu, Vishnu Purana, I'm sorry if I'm butchering all these names, uh, it was said that the four faces of the mountain were made of crystal, ruby, 
gold and lapis lazuli respectively so again that's a really wonderful image uh, if you remember that deity from Jainism I mentioned earlier who's known as Rishabha Mount Kailash is thought to be the place where he achieved moksha or liberation of the soul which is sort of the Jainism equivalent of enlightenment now in Buddhist texts Mount Kailash is equated with the mystical Mount Meru According to an ancient legend within the Vajrayana sect of Buddhism, a Tibetan Buddhist master named Milarepa, who was alive from around about 1052 to 1135, arrived in Tibet to challenge a man named Naro Bonchung, who was what's known as a Bonpo, or a follower of the Bon religion, that indigenous Tibetan religion. After engaging in a magical battle, the two realized that they were evenly matched, so they decided that whoever could reach the peak of Mount Kailash first would be the victor. Nanao Bonchung sat on a magical drum and flew up the slope, but Milarepa's followers were left befuddled when they saw their master simply just sitting and meditating. When Nanao Bonchung had nearly reached the summit, Milarepa suddenly sprung into action and overtook him by riding on the sunlight itself. Again, another wonderful image. Uh, in an act of sporting grace, however, Milarepa flung a handful of snow onto a nearby mountain, indicating that this mountain would become Bon territory, and thus securing the good relationship between the two religions. Now, with these two spiritual behemoths out of the way, let's take a look at some of the lesser known historical gems of Tibet. So this cluster of ruins that you see here are all that remains of the once illustrious Gugu Kingdom, which used to control large parts of Western Tibet. Thanks to the cool weather and dry climate, they have been beautifully well preserved for hundreds of years. In total, the ruins include over 400 rooms, 58 forts, 28 pagodas, four temples, three, arm three tombs, an armory, and a handful of other caves. As you can see from the photo, the town itself was strategically situated on a hill that's about 300 metres or about 984 foot high. The structure of the town was historically divided into three core sections. You've got the palace at the top, the temples on the middle level, and then the residential buildings at the bottom. In short, the class structure was physically reinforced through this structural hierarchy, although if you were rich, that just meant you had to climb more stairs, I guess. Uh, what makes Gulga still more fascinating is that in order to further fortify the town, the rooms are actually connected by a complicated underground system of tunnels that are all back here, embedded in the mountain, which allowed locals to move easily between the buildings without ever having actually exposed themselves to the outside world if need be. So by now I'm sure you're all wondering, if this town was so well fortified, why is it abandoned? Uh, well, in keeping with our theme today, it's all related to religion. Uh, it all begins with a ruler named Shongnie, who took over the Gulgo kingdom upon his father's death. Shong was a devout Buddhist and sent many local monks to India so they could study Buddhism in more depth. He also built the Tholing Monastery and eventually stepped down as ruler so he could pursue an ascetic life as a monk. From then onwards, he was known by the religious name of Yeshe's Odd. Now, according to local legend, he started a war with a neighboring nation that was ruled by the Karluks with the sole aim of getting enough gold to invite the well-known Indian Buddhist mas master Atisa to visit his kingdom. His plan sadly backfired, and not only did he lose the war catastrophically, but he ended up getting captured by the opposition. The leader of the Karluks promised to release him on one condition. He must convert to Islam. As you may have guessed, Yeshazad refused the offer. In an act of compromise, the Karluk leader said that his people could buy back his freedom with a pile of gold that was as tall as he was. Yeshazad accepted this alternative, but when his people did actually manage to gather together the gold, he told them to instead use it to invite Atisa to the kingdom, and he subsequently died in prison. Upon hearing this moving story, Atisa visited the Gulga kingdom in 1042 and taught Buddhism there for three years, which ushered in a golden era of Buddhism in the kingdom. This golden era, however, as I'm sure you all guessed, was not to last. So many years later, in 1624, a Jesuit priest named Antonio de Andrade arrived in the town of Gugu. The king at the time was amazed by Andrade's teachings and allowed him to build a chapel where he conducted his missionary work. While the king was very pleased with this decision, the Buddhists living in Gugu certainly were not, and it earned the ire of the chief lama, who also happened to be the king's brother. The chief lama called on more and more people to become monks in his monastery, while the king asked them to abandon Buddhism. The king, however, did have a very good reason for doing this. For many years, the Gulga kingdom had been menaced by the hostile kingdom of Ladakh. The king recognised that he needed more soldiers, not more monks. A revolt eventually took place in 1630, and the chaos allowed Ladakh forces to infiltrate Gulga. 
They were under siege for months before the king finally surrendered, which tragically marked the end of the 700-year-long Gulgur kingdom and left the town of Gulgur in its current abandoned state. As you can see from the story of Gulgur, the Tibetan people's dedication to Buddhism has never wavered throughout their history. Tibetan Buddhism's dominance over Tibetan culture means that most of the sacred spaces I've talk talked about today are predominantly connected to Buddhism. So as we continue our circuit around Tibet, let's stop off at a holy site with a kind of twist. So Wenbu South Village is located in the county of Nyanma, which is almost smack bang in the middle of Tibet. What makes this small and unassuming village so special, however, is that it's considered to be one of the historical birthplace places of a Tibetan religion known as Bon, spelled B-O-N, but with the two little dots over the O. I've mentioned Bon a few times today, but I haven't really gone into too much depth about what it is yet. So now could really serve as the perfect time. And if you want to go into more depth, I will talk about it more in the ethnic uh, deep dive, ethnic minority deep dive as well. Bon is considered to be the oldest religion in Tibet and is native to the region, with followers of the religion being known as Bonpos. Although Tibetan Buddhism borrowed heavily from the traditions of Bon and vice versa, the two have a somewhat adversarial relationship now in Tibet, with Bon being cast by Tibetan Buddhists as primitive and practitioners of Bon pointing towards their religion's longer history. According to religious doctrine, the founder of Bon was a man named Tompa Shenrab, who lived around 18,000 years ago and thus conveniently predates Gautama Buddha, the historical Buddha. Much like the historic Buddha, Tompa Shenrab was of royal birth, but renounced his inheritance at the age of 31 in order to pursue an ascetic life. This seems to be a theme for people in their 30s. I don't know what I should be doing, but uh, apparently not giving seminars. Maybe I should go on a pilgrimage. It was said that through the practice of Bon, he accessed the spiritual realm known as Tagzig Olmo Lungring, where he studied and eventually pledged his allegiance to Shelna Oka, the god of compassion. From then onwards, he decided to dedicate his life to spreading the doctrine of Bon. So where does Wenbu South Village fit into this story? Well, after a long and harrowing pilgrimage, Tonpa Shenrab arrived in an ancient Tibetan kingdom known as Jiangzheng, of which Wenbu South Village was a part. It was not the village itself, however, that caught Tompa's attention, but rather what lay just beyond it. You see, Wenbu South Village sits directly on the shores of Tangva Yumko Lake, which is the holiest lake according to the religion of Bon. Tompa recognized immediately that this lake was actually the home of the goddess Gangduo Ma, who is the highest ranking and most revered deity within Bon. For this reason, it is said that the lake can change color at random points according to her will, and will sometimes change between up to three colours in one day. I've never personally seen this, but it is something that apparently happens. In the village itself, there is a local legend that recounts how the sacred nature of the lake was discovered. Many years ago, it was said that the local people were unable to farm barley, so they would have to load their sheep with bags of salt and drive them to faraway places in order to exchange the salt for barley. It's a really harrowing process. Along the way, these travellers would suffer greatly from hunger and the cold temperatures. One day, a local couple, who were conveniently known as Dag War and Tangra Yumko, decided they wanted to save their fellow villagers from this miserable situation. They went on an expedition to the town of Chushui and snatched a bag of barley seeds. As they were fighting their way out of the town, an arrow hit the bag and the barley spe seeds spilled out onto the ground. In the chaos, they were only able to save a handful of seeds, which they brought with them back to the village. The husband, Dagwar, scattered the barley seeds by a nearby lake, and the wife, Tangra Yumko, used her own breast milk to cultivate the seeds. In the end, the seeds yielded a bumper crop of barley and provided the local people with a steady food supply for years to come. The lake and the nearby mountain were thus regarded as holy places by the local people and were named after the couple, becoming Dagwar Mountain and Tangra Yumko Lake. The lake itself covers a colossal surface area of 835 square kilometers or about 322 square miles, which makes it the fourth largest saltwater lake in Tibet. It pales in comparison, however, to the final place on our destination as we round out our full circuit of Tibet and arrive back near the city of Lhasa. Now, since I've spoken about Yamdrok Lake and Lake Manasarova, I would be remiss if I didn't spare a few moments to talk about the last of the holy trinities of lakes in Tibet, which is Namso Lake. The name Namso literally translates to mean heavenly lake. So you'll see this a lot. So here means lake in Tibetan. So the religious connections don't really get much more obvious than that. 
It rests at the base of the, sunnet, the stunning Niengshen Tangla mountain range, which has peaks that tower in at over 7,000 metres, around about 22,900 feet in height. In terms of size, Namso Lake ranks as the second largest saltwater lake in China, and it is the largest lake in Tibet. With an impressive surface area of around 1,900 square kilometers, or about 730 square miles. Uh, so to put that into perspective, because that's just all numbers, you could fit the entirety of Greater London into the lake with room to spare. Its size, however, is not its greatest claim to fame, of course. Resting at an altitude of 4,572 metres, or about 15,000 feet, it is the highest lake in the world. Uh, for centuries, pilgrims have travelled to the area in order to worship at Namso, circumambulate its vast expanse, and meditate in one of the many cave hermitages that can be found along the nearby mountain range. Within the lake itself, there are also five islands where monks would historically make pilgrimages to. Every year, they would have to wait until the waters of the lake froze over in winter before they could walk their way back to the shore and return home. Nowadays, due to safety issues associated with that sort of practice, as you can imagine, it's not really that safe to walk on icy water, uh, the islands remain uninhabited. In particular, the lake attracts a large number of visitors during the Losa or New Year period of the Year of the Sheep, according to the Tibetan calendar. It is believed that if you make offerings at the lake and walk the Kora or the pilgrimage circuit during this specific time period, your family will be blessed with good health, safety and knowledge. Since the lake is so vast, however, it can take upwards of 20 to 30 days in order to complete a full circuit around the lake itself. To cater to the numerous monks and lay people that come to the lake every year, there are actually four large monasteries located on the lake shores, each one taking up a place in one of the four cardinal directions. One of these monasteries, known as Tashidor Gompa, is actually situated on a small peninsula that cuts into the lake itself. Now, with our full circuit tour coming to an end, all that's left for me to say is thank you so much for joining the presentation, and I hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, so I've popped sort of links into the um, chat, but if you want to know more, you can either follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can go visit our website. 